Well, good morning, everyone. And uh, it's my absolute pleasure and privilege to welcome you all to what is our inaugural RISC-V Summit. Um, as, as I think many of you know who have been involved in the RISC-V initiative, uh, this is easily the largest event that we've had. And uh, I'm, I'm going to walk you through some of, some of the history of how, how we got here today. First, before I get started, I want to um, reach out and have a big thank you to our sponsors for the event, for the RISC-V Summit. Uh, listed here, Western Digital, MicroSemi, Sci-5, Amp Micro, NXP, Qualcomm, Bitmain, Ashling, Codasip, Rambus, and Ultrasoc. And it gets busier uh, for other companies who are here in the exhibit floor, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Tabletop sponsors, a bunch of startups, as well as support from a number of media and analyst outlets. Um, and uh, we have something in the neighborhood of 31 or 32 editors and analysts who are registered to attend the event, which is fantastic. Just be careful who you're talking to and what you're saying when you're talking. Make sure you know who's in the, in the, in the crowd. So with that, uh, please be sure to download and install the app if you haven't already. Uh, this is where all the agenda information is for, for the next two days. And you should have had an email with your registration package uh, to give you your credentials to do that. And if you can't find it, you can still install the app, enter the email that you actually registered for the event with, and ask you know, for your credentials to be sent to you so you, you, you can get a new password uh, sent. And you will also be able to uh, reach out and inter search for, reach out and interact with other attendees using the app. So where you will no longer be distributing attendee registration lists uh, as we have in the past for, for a bunch of obvious reasons. The other part of these events that we run is this, this is meant to be a networking event. So obviously we've got the social tools for networking and please follow along on those. But more importantly, we're all here together over the next couple of days. Take the opportunity to talk to people you don't know. I say this at every event that we run. It's great to see old friends and colleagues that you might not have seen before and hang out with them and have a beer and so on, or a glass of wine and catch up on what's going on. But from a, from a learning standpoint, seek out people that you don't know, either the speakers that we have or the, the exhibitors that are out on the floor, and just ask them what they're doing with RISC-V, right, so that you can learn more about how the ecosystem is growing. We also have a Wi-Fi uh, set up, right, it's pretty simple, RISC-V Summit, uh, SSID and password, so make sure you log on to that. This part's pretty cool. Uh, as a Canadian, I, I get to talk about hockey stick shapes. But if, if you look at, uh, at the growth that we've had for this event, this time last year, we were lucky enough to be hosted at the old Sandus campus, Milpitas uh, campus for Western Digital. And we had uh, 498 attendees registered. And it was the, the uh, we maxed out the event. And we have, I think the count this morning was 1,033. So my, my slide's a little out of date. Uh, for this event, so you know, a doubling over last year. For the technical program, we had around 250 abstracts and papers submitted, uh, which we were uh, able to whittle down and jam into 59 sessions with keynotes and, and including the, the three tracks, and then 29 exhibitors out on the floor. And we haven't had a, uh, an exhibit floor before for any of you that have been to our past workshops. So this is, uh, this is pretty cool from the very first uh, workshop that the Berkeley team put on in Monterey back in January of, of 2015 uh, to, the, to the number of attendees that we have now. So once the keynotes are done and we have our morning break and our lunch break and so on, the doors in the back of the room here open up and you get to go out onto the exhibit floor and there's a bunch of booths and tabletops and, and startup uh, um, startup stands uh, with uh, quite an impressive uh, number of companies that are in the market today with commercial RISC-V based products. Uh, so it's, it's been quite a, quite a growth uh, uh, period to, to get to this point and uh, I'm quite anxious with my role as executive director I get to see behind the curtain of what most people are doing in the ecosystem and I'm quite anxious to see what this is going to look like this time next year. Okay, so lots going on. RISC-V is a wonderful thing. 
what's all the fuss about? It's, it's really just an ISA. I mean, why, why, do we, why do we care about an ISA so much? How on earth did we get to this point where we get 1,000 people to come into a room to learn and talk about an ISA? Well, for those of you that have been involved with this, you're going to, uh, for a while, you're going to, some of this will be familiar, but back in the spring of 2010, the team at Berkeley, led by Kirsto Sanovich and Dave Patterson, were looking for a new pedagogical tool that they could use in their computer science program to teach um, processor technology and architecture. And, you know, clearly they've been involved in this for many years. The original risk work date, dates back to the uh, 80s under, under uh, Dave Patterson. And they've done a bunch of different projects, obviously using MIPS x86, Spark, and so on. And they were trying to, trying to decide on what they were going to use next. So clearly some of the obvious choices would be x86 and ARM. But as a teaching tool, both of those are way too big and way too complex. You know, if this is your, you're an undergrad student, this is your first exposure to um, microarchitecture and processor design, biting something off that complicated is probably not the right way to go. And also, clearly, there'd be IP issues associated with that, as both of those are proprietary, uh, proprietary architectures. So they've done it many times before. I said, no problem. This is in the spring. We figure we can get ready by September, kick off a three-month project, uh, have something ready to go for the fall uh, based on a clean slate design. Well, that three-month project turned into four years later, right, with the release of the first uh, uh, frozen uh, user spec, the base synergy spec. And along the way, many, many, many tape outs and test chips and research paper publications. So with all of these tape outs and publications, what became obvious uh, in the user community uh, to the team at Berkeley is there's a fair amount of people following this. They'd get feedback with, hey, don't change this. I really liked it. As they, as they you know, would publish, change something, publish, do something else, publish again. And it became obvious to the team that they should probably be looking at how to create, um, how, how to create some longevity behind the project outside the four walls of Berkeley. And this is how the foundation was created in, in the fall, or in August of 2015. And I think most of you know this by now, but just in case you don't, it is in fact risk five. It is not risk V, right? It is the fifth generation of risk research um, that happened at Berkeley. Kind of lost the recipe with uh, SOAR and SPUR for risk four and five, if you will. Uh, but this dates back to the original risk work under Patterson in the early 80s. And now that you know the origin of why it's risk five, that it's a fifth project or fifth research effort at Berkeley um, for risk based designs, anytime you hear someone say risk V, just reach out and tap them on the shoulder and say, no, no, mate, that's a five. Right, so you are now official ambassadors of the Risk Five brand, and I expect you to live up to that responsibility. So, okay, we created a foundation in August of 2015, um, and figured that hmm, maybe we'd be able to get a handful of companies, a dozen or so, maybe 20 in a year, who might be interested in in helping us standardize um, the specs behind Risk Five. But before we get into that detail, an example of any modern SOC, we've got an NVIDIA Tegra here. All the different cores that are on a modern SOC or any system like this have come from a variety of different origins to get integrated into this design. Um, but the point is, whether it's the application processor, radio and audio DSPs, they all have different ISAs. And the ISA that might be suitable for an apps processor on this, on this uh, SOC is far too large for a purpose-built accelerator or a control processor. You need something different. And unfortunately, there hasn't been anything that would allow you to cover this waterfront in terms of different application space of these cores. A lot of homegrown ISA cores might be on there for control processors that are doing you know, clock control or power control, for instance. And often up to a dozen uh, ISAs on this uh, SOC all of which come with their own software tool chain and stack to, to get the thing up. It's actually really, a, when you think about it, not very an elegant design. And this is not an NVIDIA issue. This is, how, this is how the industry has evolved. Do we really need all these different ISAs? And do they have to be proprietary ones? And what if we had one that was free and open and scalable such that the ISA could be used by everyone across all computing applications, right? And that's what RISC-V is. 
So what's different about RISC-V compared to anything else? After all, we're just talking about an ISA. It is far smaller and uh, simpler than any commercial ISA that's out there. The base ISA spec is 50 less than 50 instructions. It's very, very simple design. And arguably, having the opportunity to be informed by three decades of what to do and what not to do with risk architecture uh, implementations, you, you would expect a, a good effort. And the Berkeley team did a good job. It's a clean state design. There was a lot of effort put into making sure that uh, there are no microarchitecture dependencies or, or assumptions built into the ISA that's completely independent. And there's no such thing as coming to the foundation and saying, give me the RISC-V core, right? There are, first of all, at the foundation, there are no cores, right? Our, our members implement cores, proprietary or open source, it's up to them. And depending on what, what processor uh, architecture they're going after for the application and data set they're going after, they have their own, they have their own implementation, and we, we welcome all comers. And this is probably one of the more important uh, aspects of the ISA design. It's modular, right? The ISA is not just one great big contiguous spec. It's carved up into standard extensions, so you only implement what you need to implement for your application, letting you tune your design to the right power performance point that you need, and only uh, take, make use of the extensions that, that are required for your application. And there are multiple standard extensions, and Kirsta will talk a lot more about that in his talk. Building on that extensibility, that modularity, is the fact that now uh, we have an extensible uh, um, instruction set architecture, meaning there's a, some reserved opcode space that will never be trampled on that, uh, as a user, you can define your own instructions with your own secret sauce, your own algorithm that you want to bang into a few instructions to process uh, your specific data set. And stable. So, once we ratify and release the extensions, they will never, ever be changed, right? You can build a design that is based on a released extension and will always work and always be supported. Any new functionality or features that might, maybe in hindsight would have gone into that extension will be added through another extension. So once an, an extension is released and locked and loaded, it's frozen, cement, sunk, how, what, whatever analogy you want to use, uh, and your design will always work um, supporting those extensions. All right, so that's my sort of tour of how we got here in terms of the, um, the ISA itself. Kirsten will have a lot more detail in his talk uh, coming up here in a few minutes. So from a foundation perspective, as I said earlier, you know, we incorporated, so the, the discussion around creating a foundation really started during the second workshop, workshop which was hosted on the Berkeley campus in, in June of 2015. And we started to talk, you know, there were interested companies, MicroSemi, Western Digital, there was a bunch of interesting companies at the table, Google, who um, believed in, in the RISC-V direction and wanted to have a discussion around how, we, how can we get this thing off the ground. So uh, during that uh, workshop, we started to work on the notion of uh, founding members of, uh, of the RISC-V Foundation that could come together and work on creating a membership agreement that had the contribution rules of how we would play together in the sandbox, so to speak, and bylaws of how we would govern uh, the open standards body. Um, and we invited companies to join us in the foundation and, and work on these uh, documents together collaboratively such that uh, you know, we had something that, uh, that, many, that no single organization would have a really significant heartburn with, hopefully, and that all organizations would be able to sign and participate. It took a little while uh, to get that drafting done and completed, and we ratified those agreements in December of 2016. And fundamentally, the role and purpose of the, I of the foundation is to make sure that the RISC-V ISA is open and free and open and available to everyone for use in all, in all applications, that the specifications are available for download. We, we'll work on compliance suites so that my RISC-V implementation, when I say I'm IMAFD compliant, a set of extensions, I'm IMAFD compliant, and you say you're IMAFD compliant, that everybody knows what that means, and you know, uh, applications will run on our, our, both of our devices, assuming we have the same peripherals and so on. And the way we're going to try to uh, govern this is uh, through use of the RISC-V trademarks. So if you have a commercial device that is available for sale in the marketplace, you need to be party to the membership agreement to have license to the RISC-V trademarks. 
and, and claim compliance to the RISC-V ISA. There's no, there's no um, governing test house where you send your device or you send your implementation for compliance. The, the ecosystem and the industry will, will judge you based on you passing the test that you say you pass. Um, so a sort of a self-certification effort, if you will, or self-compliance effort. And, and, and we go from there. So we have um, a board of directors that governs the foundation, as well as uh, three standing committees, really, that will, will be in existence uh, in perpetuity. And under those standing committees, we have uh, task groups. So there is a number of task groups in the technical committee and marketing committees. Technical committee is chaired by Yunsip Lee from Sci-5, one of the principal authors of the RISC-5 work at, at Berkeley. Um, before he left to, to be one of the founders at Sci-5. The Security Standing Committee is chaired by Helena Hanschutz at, uh, at Rambus, and the Marketing Committee is chaired by Ted Marina at Western Digital. And these are very, very active committees. If you're a member and you're not participating, please do so. This is how we decide where we're taking both the marketing efforts as well as the technology efforts. And in order to participate in these committees and the underlying task groups, you need to be a member and party to the membership agreement and the rules that are in there. Our board of directors is here for, uh, for the week, maybe not all, all, uh, all of them for all, both days, uh, but if please seek these gentlemen out and have a conversation with them. Kirsta is the chair of the foundation and Dave Patterson is the vice chair. Zvonimir Bandage from Western Digital, Charlie Hawk from BlueSpec, Rob Oshana from NXP, Franz Sistermans from NVIDIA, and Ted Spears from Microchip Microsemi. This slide takes a while to come up when I push the button because there's lots of logos on it. And every time I put it up, it's out of date um, because of the frequency at which new members join the foundation. So I spend a fair amount of my time talking to legal departments uh, of new companies who want to join. They, they are fascinated by the agreement. <laughs> and want to change it in some instances. Um, every single member is party to the same membership agreement and bylaws. There are no side letters, exceptions, alternate rules for anyone. And the membership growth has been pretty staggering. Uh, I think we're at 211 right now, including individual members. And it continues to grow. Um, and if you compare that to around this time last year, it's a doubling. So depending what metric you use, whether it's the attendees at these kinds of events, whether it's the membership growth, and clearly you don't need to be a member to use RISC-V. You don't need to come to these events to use this RISC-V. But if you use those metrics as, as a proxy for what's going on in the ecosystem, it's a, it's a pretty telling story of what's gone on in the last 12 months. Just from a country standpoint, you know, we've, we're covering now about 52% of the world's population in terms of where, mem where our members come from. I'm not trying to suggest for a moment that everybody, all of that 52% has a RISC-V-based mobile device in their pocket, at least not yet. And then to give you an idea of what's coming up, uh, just before I wrap up, over the, the uh, we've had a pretty busy 2018, and uh, over 2019, these are events that we've, we know we're, we're doing, locked and loaded. Uh, we have a workshop at Hentry Science Park in Taiwan in March. Uh, as we have in the past, we'll be at Embedded World with a pavilion-style booth uh, in Nuremberg in Germany. And we have another workshop in the spring hosted by the good guys at ETH Zurich uh, and the Pulpino team uh, in June. Of course, there'll be another summit at this time next year as well, which we'll be able to announce shortly. So if you haven't followed us yet on the social media platforms, please do so. Uh, there's also support uh, mail lists on the... Uh, uh, on the site, which you don't need to be a member to participate in. These are open public mail lists. You just need to uh, sign up to, to, uh, to participate in them. Um, and I thank you for your time.